the Black Museum, the famous restoratory of death. Here in the grim stone structure of the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, an earthenware pot, a silver shilling, a typewriter ribbon, all are touched by murder. Four small bottles, well, with familiar objects, medicine bottles, shining glass, corks, the labels in neat, clear handwriting. Such bottles are in the medicine cabinet of nearly almost every home. They, these were found. Russell, the inspector, and Sergeant walking through thick shrubbery. Sergeant found one, inspector. Two mount size, inspector. The others can't be far. Sergeant, yes. Here we, here are two more. One ounce capacity hit there. These, Inspector bending down. And here, here's the fourth. Sergeant, innocent little things, aren't they, sir? Well, today those small, four small bottles have a place, a very honoured place, in a black museum. From the annuals of the Criminal Investigation Department of London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crime reported by objects in Scotland Yard Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. And here we are, the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Yes, here lies death. In these hundreds and hundreds of objects, large and small is the maze of the death. A thousand methods of killing, all neatly labelled, to indicate who or what, the, where, when. Here's a label, kitchen mop, long handle, grave with use. Grey where the red hats, brown stain fails to cover the greenness. Look closely at the harsh metal that binds the strings. This utensil, yes, his blade struck and struck again. What? And before the mop itself removed the traces of the crime. Clink of grass bottles. Ah, here we are. Here are the four small bottles. Three or one, one ounce capacity, capability. Capability. One holds two ounces. A mark of strange story. So you were leading an area era where a man was still lord of all he surveyed a woman who just women were just beginning to admire the equality. Clink of drinking glasses, Oscar. Two little ladies, Reverend, although I would prefer toasting them with something lightly stronger than tea. Edgar, Edgar. Two ladies, my friend, Anne, Anne, to listen to my husband, Reverend. You think he was old fashioned and not an advanced thinker for his age? Oscar, I an advanced thinker? Why, Annie, my dear? Why, Anne, my dear, Anne? But you are, Oscar, you really are. Oscar, at the risk of shocking me, Reverend, then, then, you're a young man and not. I have shown as easy shot as some passers I know. I believe that a man should have two wives. Edgar, really, sir? Anne. He means it, Reverend, 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 Reverend. Listen to him, Oscar. I believe that man needs two wives, one to cook, sew and care for the household, the other to be a companion when a man needs it, electrical stimulation, or to lend beauty to the drawing room, and grace and wit. Edgar, then you would, want, would you give the latter education? Oscar, exactly, and since I'm not allowed two wives, I choose the latter. You're new you here, Reverend. You don't know that I'm that I married Anne when she's very young and sent her to Brussels and then at French University for education. For sterling her, he was my wife, Edgar. Why? Why? That's unheard of, sir. You're a pioneer in this. In the view. Oh yes, Mister Oscar Stone, wholesale grocer, and man of means, has truly advanced these years. Age of ninety-nine and very liberal. His philosophies. In fact, he was not so conscious, considerate of his wife, different, and of the difference between her age and his own. He encouraged rather than looked askewing uh, her companionship with, with the Reverend Edgar Sweet, a much, much younger man than Mr. Stone himself. And Edgar, you've been a good friend to me these, these past months. Edgar, I'm happy to hear you say that, Anne. So, Anne. And that is, that is why, well, I'm not hesitating to tell you something which I feel is rather unfair. Edgar, tell me what it is. And Oscar has drawn 
Draw his will. Edgar, well, he's my friend, my good friend. I hate to see him pass on. Every man must have his house in order. And, Edgar, you don't understand. Making the will is all right. It's what he's put in it. Edgar, oh, go on, my dear. And he's left his entire estate, provided I never marry again. Edgar, that is his right, you know. And he's not, it's not his right. He's afraid someone might marry me after he's gone for the money. Edgar, he's only protecting you from fortune hunters, Anne. And that's, then why did he give me an education? If he doesn't think enough of me, to let me protect myself. A servant in Eden? Perhaps, perhaps not. But it is clear that the young woman had a will of her own and wanted to control her own destiny. In any case, a friendship ripens not only between the two young people, but between Edgar and Oscar as well. Oscar, Edgar, my friend. I do not well. I saw a doctor today, and I am not well. Edgar, I can't believe it. You look fine, fine. Oscar, the deliberation of age. Deliberation of age. Edgar, you're not old. Fifty-five is old, Edgar. Oscar, then you worked as hard as I have for almost fifty of those fifty-five years. Well, in any case, I decided to take a rest. Edgar, excellent, Oscar. Then what do you... That's what you need as an extended vo- vocation. Oscar made arrangements to go to, uh, to the shore. Go on to the shore. Month for sea ought to be pra- ought to practically well rejuvenate me. Edgar, I miss you. Our, our talks have been great stimulus to my work. Oscar, I thought that. Well, even pastors have vocations occasionally. Vacations of occasionally. Edgar. Occasionally we do. Oscar, of course. So I reserved accommodation for you, along with Anne and myself, Edgar. But I can't possibly afford. Oscar, as my guest, Edgar. You don't know how much I appreciate this, Oscar. But I can't accept this. Door opens. Anne steps in. Anne. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were alone, Oscar. Oscar, I'm glad you came in, Anne, dear. I said, Edgar, we're going to the shore for a month. And, oh, Oscar, how nice. Oscar, I'm insisting that Edgar come along as my guest. Edgar, how can I set such an invitation? Oscar, tell him you'll find him as welcome as I will, Anne. And, of course, I'll find him welcome. Oscar, Edgar knows that. Then, completely, completely. Compromised. Edgar came for weekends, the ripening of friendship, or the growth of a triangle, a classic triangle, husband, wife, and a young man. The summer ended, Oscar and Anne returned to new lodgings in Pimco. They took an additional room. Door open, steps in, close, door close. Anne, Edgar, do you like it? Edgar, bookcase, a couch, a fine desk, all this room. How could I not help liking it? And in here, doors always open. Next, right next door. Oscar, Egg, my boy, welcome to your new lodgings. Now we're not only friends, we are neighbours. Egg, really, Oscar? I don't know why you don't know. Didn't don't know why you. But there was more. I think a rather interesting one after. A rather interesting one after him, while Oscar was on his dot. Was that Edusker's office? Door opens, Anne steps in. Anne, may I just you for a moment, Edgar? Edgar, of course, Anne, what is it? Anne, remember months ago I told you about Oscar's will? Edgar, oh, yes, I remember why. Anne, he took out the awful call, calls. If I want to, I can marry anyone. I am ple- I'm pleased one day. You are the executor. Mary, uh, Everything was quite smooth, quite, quite smooth. In fact, Oscar began to feel quite a little, a little, a little bit, quite a bit better. At least he said so. Insisted that Edgar and Anne accompany him to a horse to a horse show, horse show, galloping and winning the horses. Anne, why do you love horses so, Oscar? Oscar, perhaps because I want, always wanted to ride and never learned. Oh, there's a fine animal. 
Horse whinnies lazily. Edgar, he must be at least sixteen hands high. Oscar, Edgar, why don't they take Anne to the stalls to see her favourites? I'll just sit here for a while. I guess I'm not as strong as I thought I was. And will you, Edgar, please, Edgar? Do you think you'll be all right here alone, Oscar? Horse show in the background. It was a picture, isn't it? The early husband sitting on the bench, watching the two young people stroll away. What are his thoughts? As he sees him disappear into the crowd, what would his thoughts have been if he heard their conversation? And I am dreadfully worried about Oscar. Edgar, he seems much better. Seashore did him good. And seems it is a word. He's not, not really. Edgar, Anne, what are you telling me? Anne, that his doctor was confiding in me. Oscar may not live out the year. The next morning there were signs that Anne's words might become the truth. He sent for the doctor, a youngish man named Richards, who lived some half a mile from the lodgings. Richards, I don't like this, Mrs. Stone, not at all. Anne unhappy, oh dear me, oh dear. Oscar, will you stop fronting my di- wife, dear man, your man? Richards, well, the truth, sir, in a shape, is the truth. I'm not well. Your stomach, you're not well. Your stomach is very bad shape. I shall prescribe for you and your wife. We'll see that you take your medicine, won't you, Miss Stone? And of course, Doctor. Young Doctor was very certain, but not Oscar. The pain continued. Anne was obviously very upset. She took Edgar aside and, and, Edgar, I want you to do something for me. Edgar, if I can. And I cannot see Oscar suffer the way he does at times. I know a way to ease his pain, but I need your help. Edgar, of course. And I want you to buy me some chloroform. Edgar, chloroform? And yes, a few drops of it and a handkerchief will help him sleep easier. I learned about it in the practical nursing classes in Brussels. Edgar, but Dr. Richards will not, will get you, get you, will get you some. And no, you never believe I know how to use it. Here's a pound note. Please, Edgar. Edgar went to the nearest chemist shop. Shop door opens, chemist. What can I do for you, Reverend? Edgar, I'd like some little chloroform. Chemist, whatever it's for, sir. I understand it's, Edgar, I understand it's good for taking out grease spots. Chemist, oh yes, I suppose it, it, it is. But be careful with it. It was more times Edgar worked in the, the, the chemist shops and brought a small amount of chloroform. Here are those, here are the three one ounce bottles and one two ounce bottle. Out of consideration for Anne's convenience, no doubt. Edgar poured the contents of all the four bottles into the large one. He delivered the chloroform to Anne. Quite suddenly, Oscar became a whole lot better. Oscar, Landlord, I want to speak with the landlord. Landlord, yes, Mr. Stone, how can I help you? Oscar, I want to prepare a surprise for my wife and reverend for tonight. No, no, oh, yes, sir. Oscar, a New Year's Eve party. Some roast duck, a bit of, a bit of cold ham, some good cheese, a bottle of champagne, a bottle of good brandy. Landlord, is a short notice, Mr. Stone, but I'll do my best. What do you want, be, what, Will you be eating? Oscar, what everyone else ate? Ah, eats. Ah, will they be surprised? Ah, I'm feeling wonderful. For the first time in months. And for breakfast tomorrow, see if your maid can find a haddock. A large one. Oh, I feel I could be quite hungry in the morning. Oscar didn't, wasn't hungry next New Year's morning. Oscar was dead. And today, the four small bottles which played so large a part in his death can be seen in the Black Museum. It was a sad New Year's Day for Anne Stone and a bewildering day for the Reverend Edgar Sweet. Oscar Stone, husband and friend, lay dead quite suddenly after what seemed to have indicated quite quick recovery. But it was only the first event of the January 1st, 1910. On to the scene strolled an old man, Oscar's 75-year-old father. Anne met him at the door to the stone apartment. Front door opened, father steps in. 
and oh, oh, father, 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 yes, of course. Cry all you want. I want to see my son, and he's in. He's in here, father, father. All right. Who is this? And Reverend Sweet, our good friend and pastor, father. Oh yes, yes, I heard about you. Oscar wrote me. Edgar, this moment comes to all of us, sir. We can only pray for courage. Father, I've got courage. What I want is facts. I see my boy. I see my boy now. Brethren, door opens. Father steps in. Father examines the body slowly. Oh, mm, it looks as if he died in his sleep. And he did it so peacefully. I didn't realise it until the morning. Father, you were a good boy, Oscar. I couldn't be... Uh, should be out living you sniffs and sniffs again. A oh, funny smell around his mouth. And then the doctor said he was he said he had gastritis, father. Father, that's not what I smell. Are you having a post mortem? And Dr. Richards asked for permission to do one. Father Richards, who's he? Edgar, the family doctor, Mr. Stone, a fine young man. Father, well, all right. He wants to do it, all right. But I want my, I want my man there with him, father. And father, you, what are, are you inseminating, father? I'm not inseminating anything. I just don't like the look of this. For this, for his own protection, the riches ought to have another wine present, that's all. My boy, the second doctor arrived, and forthwith, behind locked doors, the hour of Trotsky was informed. Landlord parlour Anne waited with Edgar to give her support and courage. Presently, the door opened. Parlour door opens. Richards, Mrs. Stone, and um, yes, Dr. Richards, Richards, we're ready for you with our report, Anne. Um, did you find any, out anything? Richard, we've got not certain as yet. Dr. Fetcher, your father's in-laws, man, suggests Mr. Stone to want more chloroform. Edgar, chloroform? Richard, yes. Will you come upstairs and hear the report, please? Door closes, Edgar. Anne? Anne, yes. Edgar, did you, the chloroform I brought for you, that is, it is. Anne, it was still in the bottle, Edgar. Don't, don't worry, you don't even have to mention it. Shall we go upstairs now? Two men, young people were upstairs, but no hand in hand. There's suddenly reserved between them. A room where the doctors and they all, and old Mr. Stone awaited them. Room door opens. Door closes. Father, this is Dr. Fletcher, my daughter-in-law, and Pastor Sweet. Biz, Fetcher, and Edgar exchange in greetings. How do you do, Fletcher? And Dr. Richards was in charge of the case. Perhaps he's the one to give you our official report. And, oh, please do, Miss Dr. Richards. Dr. Richards is a turning single report. We are unable to find any natural cause of death. Contents of the stomach are suspicious. We're holding them for the coroner. And grass, father, have you any particular suspicious suspicions, gentlemen? Richards, none which we can care to state officially. F- Fletcher, you realize the room where death occurred is sealed and its contents must not be touched. And my purse is in there. Father, it will have to stay there. And why, surely I may have my coat and have a hat. Father, soon so, if Dr. Fletcher present when you remove them. Anne went to stay with her cousin. A brief train ride journey way the coroner request was held and adjourned. Pending a full report from the government analysis. That was all. But Edgar dispatched a note to Anne and, and she met him. As requested as he requested, a quiet tea room in Pumco. Number of tea room crowd. Anne. Edgar. What's the matter with you? You haven't looked at me straight in the eye since we met today. Edgar, 
I can't seem to help myself, Anne. Dr. Richards did tell you what Oscar might not live out the year. And, well, of course he did. Edgar, I, I came so suddenly. It will be, they all behave so strangely, Anne. I'm afraid that I'm finished. If this, this develops into anything, I shall lose my pulpit. Anne, you don't, you didn't do anything foolish. I certainly wouldn't. Edgar, everything's going wrong. I feel as if Anne had brought that chloroform. from. There is chloroform from the minister to pull to Anne. Did you see? Did you see, Anne? Forget chloroform. Forget all about it. Edgar, I can't. Where is it? What did you do with it? Anne, I took it from, with me when I left the apartment. Right into my coat pocket. Right under the nose of my dear father. Or I pulled it out. The train window and I oh, threw the bottle away. Edgar, oh, that makes me worse. You proved that Oscar was, but you don't see a trace of the chloroform to me. And in other words, Edgar, you're implying that I gave it to Oscar. Edgar, I'm not implying anything of the kind. And what else are you saying? Edgar, you helped me over a bad time. Now I think it's all we, we will be beat if we could do not see each other any more. Goodbye, Edgar. The lady was annoyed, perhaps rightly so. The young man was frightened, very rightly so. So, in their separate ways, each awaited the report of the government analysis. At long last, Dr. Richards came to the young widow. Richards, the news could be a lot worse than like stone. It could have been arsenic, or one of the slower, more common poisons. And what have you found, Doctor? Richards, poisoning by chloroform. And... Huh? Oh, Doctor, that what else is the worst? Richards, how so? Don't tell me you had some in your possession. And I did. I had my reason, Doctor. My married wife was not happy. I'm young. He was old, practically my father. He kept putting me into Edgar's company. I began to, when two people got together constantly, Richards, please go on, Mrs. Stone. And... I obtained the drawer from my kept in a drawer. I never had a secret from Oscar. Never to my, and my uh, uh, on any score. The New Year's Eve, after my, uh, my party, I told him I had it. And where it was, he spoke to me sadly but kindly and greed. I had been feeling about him as, uh, as I did. He went to sleep, or so, or for, I'm sorry, I thought he did. The next I know he was dead. Richards, did you look at the bottle? And yes, I did. I couldn't tell how much was gone. I took the bottle and I poured out that wax into it from the train as I went. I poured what was left of it that was in it from the train as I went. The old taxi report came to, to Oscar's egg as well. He wrestled with himself and finally took the funny course which seemed open. He got spit to sweat, Stuart. In fact, yes, come in, sir. Sit down. Door closes, chair scrapes. As Edgar sits, Edgar, thank you. I expect I send you some information on the matter of the death of Oscar Stone. Edgar, I do. You see, I brought the chloroform. Russell of Inspector Sergeant walking through the thick shrubbery in agreement with the following. Inspector, they should be uh, here somewhere, Sergeant. If, 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 it's, if, the little per, if the little person is telling the truth, it's better to sure he is. Sure he sure let himself in for something with that woman, didn't he? So then, it looks like that way. Leave it to the woman to the woman every time. It's better grease spots her. Not bad for amateur. I suppose this is a ghoul's patch. We said he threw those are small bottles. So then, yes. This is the place. Please, it's discrimination. I found one, Inspector. Two outside, the doc, Inspector. The others can't be far. So, yes, here are the two more. One ounce capacity here, these. Inspector, bend it down. Here's the fourth. So, innocent little things, aren't they, sir? Inspector, grand stone, I have warrant for your arrest on the charge of willful murder of your husband. Inspector, 
Edward, sweet, I have a warrant for your arrest. You will stay in charge as a suffrage before the fact. The murder of Oscar Stone. The trials are placed at the next Assizes. Gravel bangs twice. Judge, gentlemen of the jury, and the Attorney General has said, what, who was this case in hand, for all knowledge of the facts, will present no evidence against Reverend Mrs. Sweet. You are rather directed to find him not guilty. I shall order his release at once. Courtroom crowd murmurs. Gravel bangs gently down. Edgar Sweet left the courtroom with a much wiser young man. Trail and stone proceeded and rested a tolly on the medicine evidence. Me- 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 medical, medical evidence. Gavador bangs twice. Counsel. Dr. Fisher, you have described yourself as an expert in criminal technology. We have accepted you as such. Is that correct? Fletcher, it is, sir. Counsel, very well. Now I call the particular attention to the jury to the, the answers you give to these questions, as they will have great meaning, hearing, bearing on the evidence that, against my client. The first, sir, have you, have you known, ever known of a recorded case of murder by liquid chloroform? Fletcher, no. Counsel, is there any record of the any knowledge of provisible of elimination this liquid? Of anything pouring it down to a victim's, or anyone pouring it down a victim's throat? Fletcher, there, there is not. Okay, so is, if the victim was sleeping, for instance, Fletcher, the burning would waken him up, waking him. He'd probably go down his flint pipe and then he'd gull it. Of so. And it would be burned, clean, riveted after death. Fletcher, there would be. Counsel, there is, there is, in, in your opinion, not Fletcher. Is it impossible to commit? It is impossible to commit murder by liquid chloroform. Fletcher, nothing's impossible, but it's highly improbable. Counsel, thank you, Doctor. That is all. Chief witness of the Crown, Doctor Fletcher, has given his testimony, and all that remains of the opinion of defending counsel, so as to create a reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury. He called no witnesses, but spoke for six hours, as summing up. In it, in essence, he said, Counsel Oscar Stone was a loving and a fairly husband. He felt like his life was over. Remember, he was eccentric, a bleeding, having two wives. Can we say that of this man who was given so, so much of his sweet young woman, a wife, who was not prepared to give her the greatest gift of all, a freedom? Once he knew that chloroform was in the house, could he not have taken it himself and pass quickly into the coma? Which ended in death. If he gave, and if he gave, he gave this lonely girlfriend freedom. If he, and if he gave this lovely girl freedom, are you who sit in the judgment? Do not any less. The judge was clear. It's somewhat odd. Caustic is charged to the jury. Judge, there have been sweet faces which hide guilty consciences before, but a young wife and a young man are thrust into daily contact by a doting husband. Strange events have a way of taking place. All this is true, but one solid, solid remains. We may find this woman guilty of charge only if it no, only if no reasonable doubt exists in your minds that she did commit the crime of which she stands. The jury deliberated for two hours. There were twelve solemn men when they fell back into the jury box. Anstone rose to face them. A clerk asked for the verdict. The foreman rose and spoke clearly. Foreman, we have considered the grave suspicions in this case. We find no evidence that would indicate who administered good poison to the victim. We find the accused, therefore, not guilty. But despite that perhaps a surprising verdict of not guilty, four famous small bottles can be seen today in the Black Museum. No doubt jeopardy. That's an ancient English law. No double, no double jeopardy. No double jeopardy. That is an, that is an English, 
ancient English law, no double jeopardy. One cannot be tried twice for the same offence. It was felt, therefore, that since Anne Stone had been acquitted, if she had committed this crime, she ought to be told the world how it had been done, but no. All that was heard thereafter from Anne Stone was a letter addressed to the offending counsel, which read as follows, Dear Sir Edward, I feel I owe you my life. Your earnest efforts I have not been a good woman. My temptation has been terrible, but though I have not kept my vows, you will judge me mercifully. And there, there the case rests. And now, until we meet next time in the same place, I tell you another story about the Black Museum. I mean, as always, a yours.